command had to keep the operation a secret, even from their own men. They told us nothing. They told us absolutely nothing. We didn't know anything. For nearly 40 years, Operation Tiger remained a secret. I was on a secret mission mm -hmm. when they first were designing and developing them mm -hmm. in England. Really? Oh. I was at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, mm -hmm. and there were 48 small boat crews in our division. Mm -hmm. I was selected for this mission. These DD tanks were self-propelled. Sherman tanks with that in rubberized canvas around them, mm -hmm. and then they had three inner tubes at intervals, one at the base, one in the middle, and one on top. get a picture of it. I got a picture And one on top. When they first launched those tanks, they launched them from LCTs, and their ramp was only about nine to ten feet long. Okay. And they found out that when the Sherman tank went off of that ramp, that the, the change was too dramatic. And some of them tanks sank. My, our job was to rescue the crews. Really? Well, you know what's interesting? Now, you were talking about the ships unloading this, the Shermans. Let me come down to here now. Um, Sergeant Fritz took a shot at this one. And see, there's your little ramp. Ah, see? see? Initially, so, they didn't have those Yeah, ramps. because when the, when, the, when the tank went off, it was like it would. It we, would rock too much and get swamped. They, you know? would, the dispersing was just too rapid. It would not flow. That's right. Yeah. So I often wondered what the heck these were for. Well. And then now I found out later on that that was to ease them in. When they extended those ramps, mm -hmm. those Sherman tanks went down, just mm -hmm. floated in the water just mm -hmm. like a butterfly, mm -hmm. engaged their propellers, mm -hmm. and off they off went. Off they went. Yeah. Afterwards. Let me see. This is. Um, let me just get to the one here. I think, uh, let's see. I've got a picture of what you're talking about right here. This. See, there's the train. Yeah. And there's the apron that comes yep. up. It's inflatable. And there's the screws. Mm -hmm. and the other now, you were talking about a top secret mission. Yes. Um, I talked to uh, some of the people in the 70th Tank Battalion were probably on the mission with you because they were driving the floating tanks. Operation Tiger. The Allies launched a massive dress rehearsal for the invasion of Normandy, the famous D-Day landings that would happen five weeks later. But that rehearsal turned into one of the war's biggest fiascos, and it took place on Slapton Sands, a beach in southwestern England. Okay. And this is Sergeant Fritz, who took these at Slapton Sands in southern England. Slapton Sands, boy. That brings... You know where that is. I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, you ever heard of Operation Tiger? Yeah. Exercise Tiger? Oh, yeah. For nearly 40 years, Operation Tiger remained a secret. Allied Command did not want the bulk of the troops about to risk their lives um, going over to Normandy, knowing of this disaster that had unfolded in the West Country of England. My roommate, mm. while I was on the Operation Secret mm. Mission, mm -hmm. he was on that maneuver mm -hmm. when the German E-boats attacked that night. 300 Allied ships were sent into the English Channel, and around midnight, April 28, 1944, they started to approach the British shores. A German patrol fleet is out in the English Channel, and quite by chance, it picks up on its radar this enormous flotilla of vessels and dramatically and suddenly launches attacks on some of the uh, easy pickings of this flotilla. When I got back to my sh unit, the master at arms is packing the gear of my shipmate. And I said, what happened to Jim Crow? Well, Jim got transferred. Well, that was a bunch of bullshit. You know why? Because they wanted to keep it secret. They it were was, sworn to top secret. They were, it was highly embarrassing. I found out 30 years later mm -hmm. that Jim got killed. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. interesting. But more people were killed in the rehearsal for the landing at Utah Beach than were killed in the actual landing at Utah Beach. 946 men who lost their lives that day, April 28, 1944. You know how many of those tanks actually landed in Normandy? Well, uh, the Utah Beach landing uh, was successful almost 90%, but the ones at Omaha Beach 
a lot of them didn't make it. I think it was less than than 10 percent. They had 32 of these tanks designed. Yeah. yeah. Two of them made it to the beach. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, yeah. They were launched three to four miles out at sea, mm -hmm. and they were swamped. That was uh, that was the Omaha. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Utah ones with 70 tank battalion had calmer seas really? and they made them all in. I landed on Utah Beach. I, I know all about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a picture of Utah Beach. Uh, so and the you, difference, the, really the difference between... These are, these are from the 70 tank battalion relatives, but this is a, a picture of Utah taken from with uh, Sergeant Erickson. And but then, you, know, you know, the difference between Utah and Omaha Beach mm -hmm. was the elevation. Mm -hmm. Omaha, mm -hmm. the enemy had, you know, like right. a couple hundred feet or more. Mm -hmm. And our beach, as you showed here, was maybe 15 to 20 feet. It came in gradually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. those beaches, when the tide was out, mm -hmm. they were a quarter to half a mile wide. Mm -hmm. And if you unloaded your truck and it wouldn't start, the tide would come in and sometimes get you. See, like this? Well, I'll tell you. Did see you this? ever see a guy with a pipe sticking out of the water in his head? And that's all you see? But you know what he's doing? He's mm -hmm. operating a, a bulldozer mm -hmm. and he's pushing sand underneath the, the bow of the LST so that when the tide goes out, Mm -hmm. We got 20 tanks on the tank deck. Yeah. Guess what's going to happen? They cracked. Ours did. Mm -hmm. Here we are suspended about a third of the LST is out of water. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the guy is with the tank. As I, I've never seen anything like this. They took and uh, they had some way of waterproofing those engines mm -hmm. that they could operate underwater. Mm -hmm. it's, Fantastic. Right, that's a, uh, uh, let's see, I think I had a picture, that's a snorkel setup. Um, it probably looks something like this. Um, see, it has these curved things on the back of the tank and you can operate the tank very yeah. underwater almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the guy that was, you saw the picture of the guy that was uh, stuck with his uh, Jeep. That had a snorkel setup on yep. it too. See, yep. see, there's a snorkel, yep. but for some reason it quit. You know and the, why? And the tide came in and got if, him. If you didn't waterproof your engine good enough, that's what the hell happened. Mm -hmm. The water so killed the engine. And by the way, the book we're looking at, it's uh, a history of the 70th Tank Battalion who landed at Utah Beach and it's pictorial. So you, you'll see many of the photos that he's talking about. And it's interesting to have it confirmed that those ramps on the LCTs landing craft tanks yep. were extensions so that you could launch the the units. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. And see, here's the um, all the LSTs lined up. Notice the barrage balloons are up. Yeah, up boy, all boy, that I on. Those by the hundred. Yeah. And then um, I think that's all I had of Normandy, the landings. Well, I'll tell you, when the sun came up on D-Day, I've never seen as many ships in one mm -hmm. place at one time. Mm -hmm. It almost looked like you could walk back to England on the ships that were so many. Mm -hmm. 5,000 more plus, they said. But the sun comes up and I see this cloud and I realize later it's not a cloud at all. It's, these are planes, a mass of planes of all kinds bombers, fighters, cargo, towing uh, mm -hmm. gliders, and it was, and that was between Omaha and Normandy, uh, Omaha and Utah Beach. Wow. And uh, one of the, one of our missions at the end of the day, the beach master ordered us to broach our boat. Really? Yeah. And wait, he said, because the all of the glider pilots were instructed that after they made their landing that they should work their way back to the beach mm -hmm. and then we would pick them up and take them out to the ship mm -hmm. in case they had to fly another mission. Right. Do you know how many glider pilots I picked up? I don't know. 
one. Mm -hmm. What happened to the rest of them? I a lot know. of casualties. Uh, the, the, the landings were very difficult, and I've talked to many veterans who were injured, you know, when they landed the gliders and they were incapable of flying again, you know, yep. because it, if you look at them, a lot of times it's a controlled crash. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally overweight. And yeah. yeah. And the, even the guys that, I uh, remember the Pegasus Bridge landing by the British? Yeah. The two okay. pilots that got the, the flying cross for that, when they landed, the darn front of the glider fell off and they went flying with it and they both got knocked out. Yeah. Well, one of the, while we, were, while we were on the beach waiting for the glider pilots and the tide was out, and there we are high and dry. Mm -hmm. One German fighter plane, how the hell it got through, I don't know. But there we are on the beach, naked as a jaybird, Jeez. and this guy is strafing the beach, and there's no place to go. You just hit the sand, and you hear this pop, pop, popping all around you. Mm -hmm. And when it's all done, you, you get up and you, you can't believe that you're still in one piece. That's this amazing guy, you get through. This guy flew the end of the, to the end of the beach, mm -hmm. climbed up almost, I would say, 2,000 feet, mm -hmm. flies back over the beach. Now by this time, mm -hmm. every aircraft, any aircraft gun is shooting at him. Mm -hmm. And they, they finally hit him and they bring him down. Mm -hmm. He rolls the plane over and I'm telling you, I see this happen. He rolls his plane over and bails out opens up his parachute, waving a white flag. <laughs> but that didn't help him a bit. I can still see the tracer bullets oh, going in. Going in. I, that, I'm not very proud of that moment. Mm -hmm. Nobody took prisoners either side the first day. Mm -hmm. But the second day and after subsequent days, there were just thousands and thousands of prisoners coming down to the beach. We'd haul them out to the ships and some came back to the States, or some went over to England, and, mm -hmm. and whatever. That's so. interesting. Well, then they leave. That's uh, the New Utah Beach. Yeah. Utah Beach. Well, our mission was, the troops that we landed here were to cut off the peninsula, mm -hmm. and, and thereby capturing Sherberg. And once they captured Sherberg, there was no need for us landing supplies on the beach, they would land here into the harbor, mm -hmm. and they would load them right onto the trains and take the supplies by train. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that was supposed to happen in eight or ten days. It took almost 30 days before they captured And the Germans it. didn't leave it in very good condition. No, either. they didn't. They blew up everything in the right. harbor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was in Marseille after we went down, after Normandy, we went down to the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and we made the invasion of southern France. Oh, yeah. And, uh, my dad was in on that one. Really? Yeah. Well, my I, dad was a translator for the first French army, which came uh, came uh, on shore with the, I forget what what was that, Sixth Corps or something. Like that? I don't. We landed. All I know, remember mm -hmm. that we landed on Red Beach. Yeah. And our mission was to capture a, um, a bridge that went over a ravine because there's a coastal highway that runs all along southern France. Mm -hmm. And if the Germans blew up this bridge, they would have created another two or three hundred mile uh, mm -hmm. diversion. Mm -hmm. So our mission was to capture that bridge. No, that's and that's, we landed on a beach probably 300 feet wide. Mm -hmm. Normally, there's anywhere from seven to 10 to 12 boats land in one wave. Mm -hmm. We could land only three at a time on that beach. It was so small. No kidding. No. So I was the first boat in the second wave, mm -hmm. and we hit the beach. Of course, down goes the ramp, off goes the troop, mm -hmm. and we're in the sheltered bay. So we back off, raise the ramp, and head back out to sea. The coxswain is the only guy above the the gunnel in the small boat. So, but I, when I came in, I took my course. And then on the way out, I steered by reciprocal course. Uh -huh. And but I'm I'm down here, and I'm steering this way by a compass. And I get out into the open water, and I look down, and here in the corner, right in front of me, in front of the bulkheads, here's a guy in a fetal position, shaking oh. like a leaf. Oh, oh. Yes. 
I said, God damn it, Savior. Mm -hmm. He said, go ahead and shoot me. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, this is my fifth invasion. I, I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I said, combat fatigue. Yep. Mm -hmm. Coxon's more 45. Yeah. And we were supposed to fire over the head of the troops if they wouldn't get off of the boat. Oh. And I always, I, in retrospect, here you got 36 troops. Mm -hmm. With hand grenades, mm -hmm. machine guns, rifles, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I got a 45 pistol. Now, who the hell do you think is going to win that battle? <laughs> I don't know. Did you? Did they ever not go? Never. You know, only this in one man. Okay. And he was, he was a basket case. Oh boy, he really was. Well, I, I only saw combat in World War II, but I served in Vietnam and Korea. As I tell you, I retired in 1966. Mm. It'll be 50 years that I've been retired next year. Well, I'll tell you, I was in the reserve, Navy Reserve, and one night, three of us are out drinking. Liberty. And somebody said, uh, well, this is when we were civilians. Somebody said, let's re-enlist. Oh, sure. I said, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. Why not? So the next morning, we went down to the recruiting office to re-enlist. Bob. Yes. Excuse me a second. I'd like you to meet Lee Harris, a fellow Coast Guardman. Oh. Just showed up. Lee was uh, 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 AKA, AKA um, but my uh, hometown now is Green Bay, Lydia, Wisconsin. What's, what's our AK? Six, yeah. uh, my hometown is right, uh, right here. <laughs> and we're how AK old are you? AK 16, which 92. is the Aquarius. And he was at Okinawa. Boy, oh Paul, boy. Nice to meet you. Loading right. boats off I the ship. I just turned 90. To the land. Right. I just turned uh, a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, more Coast Guard guys. Than one of those. I tell you, oh, no. uh, uh, Coast Guard reunion. I'm cracking my head off. Oh, okay. So he's glowing. You know, if you could get a picture there. of the three of us uh -huh. Coast Guard guys. Yeah. Yeah. What, where did you serve? I served. Why don't you come Pacific. on up here? In the Pacific Ocean. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I I never got to the Pacific. I went to the Atlantic. And I stayed there for a year. And on a, I was on my way to the Pacific. And I took sick going through the Panama Canal, okay. and I wound up in the Naval Hospital in uh, Cocosola, Panama. And they were supposed to send me to the Philippines to pick up my ship. They never did. Mm -hmm. I spent the rest of the war in, uh, in Panama. February of 1942. Really? Okay. And I was in the Navy in 43, so okay. that was discharged. They kicked me out. Yeah? In, 50, in December of 55. Oh, okay. Or 45. 45. 45. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. You must have had a lot of points then. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you know, in that time you got out on the point system. Right. And it depended on how much combat you had and how many dependents you had and yes. all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They added it all up. And and if I finally, you got a lot of points, you got home early. I finally wound up, I had 64 points, uh -huh. and, and I was discharged in uh, March of 46. Okay, okay. I had 54 uh, points. Oh, really? 50, okay. well, you see, but yeah. you're older and you probably had more time combat overseas. Yeah. yeah. So exactly. that, uh, mm -hmm. that was the old, the old system then. We're, we're telling all our Marine guys, when you exit that boat, go that way. Don't go off the front because the boat could yeah. actually come forward. Well, normally, I'm the, I'm the one. I when we were on the beach, we always kept it in the forward. Yeah. Right. With the throttle not wide open, with the throttle not wide open. Mm -hmm. That way you were always in contact with the boat. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, so, guy, this guy would make a good amphibious sailor. <laughs> Hey, Bob. Here in the villages. Navy regulations. We had, you know, we had four-man crews, mm -hmm. coxswain, mm -hmm. engineer, gunner's mate, mm -hmm. and a signalman. That's right. I told you about the guy sitting in front of me, uh, uh -huh. right down in there. And when I'm up there, I can't see down there. And oh, yeah. That's where he's... No kidding. Yeah. Uh, well, like, you know, at the time, uh, at that time frame, um, Combat fatigue was not well understood. Amen. You know, you nowadays know, it's called post-traumatic stress. In World War One, it was shell shock. Yeah. Right. At the pause, mm -hmm. if you were going forward, if you didn't pause for 10 or 15 seconds, you could put it in reverse, but you weren't going to go in reverse at all. 
still kept going. Still kept forward. going. Oh, so you had to anticipate so, it. Because I know in the early drawings of the Eureka boats, they had air system. Yeah. So had, uh, you know, a pneumatic system to run this thing. I said, yep. what a, what a setup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, this was much easier. I thought. Well, there's a familiar sound. Yeah. Yeah, it was great, you know, you got mm -hmm. turn it for acceleration and right. then back and forth. Yeah, yeah. right. Flying moors, you know what that was? The flying what? A flying moor. Oh, mooring coming in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You come in at flank speed, and when you get alongside the dock, you back her down full and rev her up. Okay. Chair everything apart. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Just turned 90 in last November. Wow! Wow! So, yeah, this is quite a quite a show. How many runs did you make into Normandy? I stayed on the beach. We landed in, on the 6th of June, and we left the beach, the small boatmen I left the beach uh, somewhere around the 12th or the 15th of June, so we stayed there, and we hauled supplies, and we hauled wounded, we hauled prisoners of war, and uh, we just did anything and everything that had to be done. I remember one time, the tug had towed over two army barges loaded with munitions and then they turned it over to us and it was six small boats, two on each side and two astern. We took these barges into the beach. I often said one stray bullet and they'd have heard that explosion back in London. It was, it was just one of those things. And everything on the, on the beach Depending upon what you were hauling, if you were hauling gasoline, that went one place, foodstuffs went here, ammunition went here, and so forth and so forth. You never just landed everything all in one place, which made sense, because if, if, if the munitions went up, you still had your food supplies, food supplies, K-rations. I ate K-rations until they came out my ears. <laughs>